as an adult now, looking back, it was just constant anxiety. I grew up I had a pretty traumatic childhood. I grew up with an alcoholic father. My father figure was unable to be trusted, right? So of course, like you go into the world and you think like, and this is like a big generalization, but like every man is not to be trusted. Losing a parent is one thing, but I think the grief of losing a parent that you never really had a good relationship with and the idea of ever having a good relationship with them is completely gone was really challenging for me. Think like your everything expands in traveling. Your ability to handle the unknown expands. Okie dokie. Good afternoon there. Amanda Carnero, thank you so much for joining me today on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Hi, Gareth. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So you're sitting there in your backyard. You, you find yourself a new home. How uh, how are you settling in? <laughs> yeah, this isn't my new. This is a temporary home while I figure out if this is the place that I want to call home. And just to like, you know, explore different neighborhoods and just figure out exactly where I want to be. But yeah, it's it's been really nice. Like as I said to you earlier, it's being in Central America for most of the last like four years. It's it's been nice to be in the U.S. and have like you know, running water all the time and electricity and just like modern conveniences, Amazon, getting deliveries. It's just been a nice change. I'm sure I'll begin to miss everything else, which I already do, but it is just like a nice change and it, it feels really good so far. Yeah, that's cool. I know exactly what you mean because I've been living in Brazil for four years now and there are certain things that you that you definitely start missing. Uh, like, I don't know, like Amazon, like you said, you know, like, okay, cool. You, you get such great stuff, uh, you know, on there, like quickly for a good price. Um, things like electronics, you know, I mean, I, I do electronics and stuff and um, Brazil is not a place for that, that's for sure. And I can imagine like living in Costa Rica, it's probably a lot like the rest of South America and Central America where it's maybe a bit pricey and not everything there is available. So pricey. I remember I bought headphones and it was like, I don't even know how much, it was like probably triple the price of like Apple headphones than it would be in America. And I was like constantly living in fear because, you know, my whole business is based off of my laptop. And I was like, what am I going to do if something like my laptop gets rained on or wet or breaks? Like, I'm going to have to like fly somewhere to go get it fixed. Like, it, I was like constantly living in fear of like something happening and having to like replace it and just like, yeah, it's it's challenging because there's not even a, there is not even somewhere to fix your laptop there like you would have to leave yeah i've actually i've had i had that happen so uh, my my macbook uh died and uh there was no like apple store anywhere and it was also during covid so that if there was one it was closed <laughs> the nearest one was like in sao paulo which was like a hour's flight away and a three-hour drive and um i actually my, i stopped doing the podcast because i couldn't record anything and then, um, yeah, then eventually I had to buy a new one and it was literally, it, it really hurts because it was like three times the price and I was like, mm, this gets me, you know, so it's, it's a mission sometimes. I mean, it's great because it is, I mean, where are you in Brazil? I'm in a place called Florino Florinopolis. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Good surf town. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I've, I've, I've had my eye on, on going there for a bit of time now. Um, but it's like paradise, you know, it's paradise in so many ways. On the, on the basic level, but then when it actually comes to like running a business and and getting things that you need, it's it is challenging for sure. So and yeah. I think people forget that when they see like photos or they hear stories, they're like, oh, I wish I could do that. But it's 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 not an easy life, that is for sure. But I think like the the benefits outweigh the sort of like negative side of things, you know, that the lifestyle, the quality of the food, the the weather these sort of things like you know for someone like you and someone like me like these are sort of such uh, key values in our lives like so so yeah we 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 take the pain on some things but we we get the benefit in others yeah just the ease of of being able to be healthy like coming back to the states um not so much here it's a, it's it is pretty easy here especially the weather is so great here and I'm in Colorado at the moment but I was traveling through the states the last few weeks and I was like wow it is so challenging to be healthy here you know, like in an apartment building, it's like, you have to like, just like it's, you know, when I was in Costa Rica, you just step outside, you get me your morning sun, you get grounded, you can walk to the beach. 
it's like you're you're really struggling to be healthy. You have to like really work in order to like get out of the house, especially if you live in an apartment building. It's like you have to put your blue light blocking glasses on to like get out, go out, go into the hallway because there's all these like bright lights. You don't have control of your environment, and then find somewhere to go ground. And it's like just so much traffic and pollution and people, and it is it requires so much more intention to be healthy in the States and in a lot of other places than say living on the beach somewhere. And people don't realize either how, I guess, unhealthy it is living in, you know, like say, say the States is one example and, and big cities and stuff. They, they don't really realize what they're missing out on. You know, I lived in London for 20 years and I didn't realize until like I moved to Brazil like, okay, cool. Yeah. I've really been missing this for 20 years, you know, cause I lived in, I grew up in South Africa and, uh, just, I mean, just having amazing weather all the time was like such a big thing. I almost had to pinch myself. I was like, oh, it's sunny two days in a row. Wow. That's pretty cool. <laughs> you know? And, um, <laughs> you don't really get that in the UK, that's for sure. And then you don't, you don't really necessarily get outside. And like I said, you take your shoes off even like, it's just, it's kind of almost a foreign concept. Totally. And then you start, you do, I do think that there becomes the time where you start to take advantage of it or you don't, you don't really necessarily, you forget how amazing it is to live there and how amazing the weather is. And then you almost have to like, I think it's good to like take breaks from that environment just to remember how good you have it where you are, because it can, you know, all of the challenges of living somewhere like that can can start to wear on you and so sometimes you have to like kind of leave and just say just remind yourself like okay yeah i don't <laughs> it is really challenging to like live in an apartment building or live in shitty weather or what have you to like remind yourself of that and then go back and you really start to appreciate it again because we can often lose that appreciation for all the amazing things that we have where we live if we don't remind ourselves of what, how things used to be or how a lot of people are living. I totally And for agree. me too, like I live, you know, I'm, I'm in my little bubble. So it's often like, I'm like, oh, it's so easy to be healthy. You know, and as like a, a, a nutritionist and somebody who creates content around health, I think it's, it's been very good for me to see like, okay, it is, it does take a lot more work than just like, it, it, it's, it makes, it reminds me of, the challenges that the average person has, which I think is really good for me. Yeah, for sure. Cause like, you know, you, you probably got into the sort of mindset where you're like, you oh, know, it's so easy guys, you know, like just go out and go to the beach and, um, you know, get your fresh take a swim. smoothie. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you, so now you, now you, now it's probably good because you can sort of recalibrate maybe and go, okay, cool. Maybe I can change the content a little bit or whatever. So lots of lessons. Like even just, um, you know, all of the quote unquote healthy processed food that we have in America that we just, just doesn't seem that we have a lot of that in other places. Like in Costa Rica, I mean, we had this like organic shop and they had some, there was processed food there for sure. And there's processed food everywhere, but the gluten-free, seed oil-free options, there just wasn't many. So it just didn't really appeal to me. I just was like, I'm just not, I would never buy that. But you come back to the States and the Groceries or stores are just full of these healthy options. Like they are healthy, right? But the ability to control our overeating or overindulgence in these quote unquote healthy foods is really challenging in all processed foods, even if it's seed oil free and gluten free and, you know, all the things free and there's just it has the best ingredients. It is really challenging to control your intake of those foods when they're around you. And there's a there's a convenience store and a grocery store in every corner in America, it seems. So it's like, it's so easy to just like, you have food at your fingertips at all times. It just becomes more challenging to moderate your intake here as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, geez, I've, I've traveled America quite a bit. And I mean, I think the first time I went there, I put on 14 kgs in like four months, I think. Uh, I was really young and I, was, I, I, worked, I worked in a summer camp and, and then I traveled on like barely any money. So I was eating McDonald's and whatnot for breakfast. But 
yeah, it was, that was a definitely a different experience, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenge for sure. You know, um, trying to, trying to just stay healthy and eat well, you know, when all these things are sort of like bombarding you, um, constantly. So yeah, Amanda, I, um, was reading your bio, right. And you write, you wrote in 2005, I overcame my lifelong battle with depression and anxiety and also shared the extra 30 pounds that I'd put on when going through this experience. Are you able to just maybe speak a little bit about, you know, depression and suffering from it, like lifelong, like that, that sounds quite, quite hectic, you know, like maybe as a youngster being depressed. Yeah. I think for a long time, I didn't know that I was, or I didn't know that I had anxiety. Like I would always complain of stomach aches. Like I remember always complaining to my mom about stomach aches. And I just thought like, yeah, I just, I don't know, mate. Like I just, I didn't really even have a, an idea of what it even was, but as an adult now looking back, it was just constant anxiety. I grew up, um, I had a pretty traumatic childhood. I grew up with an alcoholic father who, um, it's funny. I was having a conversation yesterday with, with somebody and they were like, yeah, my parents are alcohol. I think my parents are alcoholics too. And I was like, no, 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 you, you don't, you don't get it. Like my father was not a functioning alcoholic. Like he couldn't hold down a job. He was like in and out of rehab, um, was also physically abusive to my mother. So I was like a young girl growing up in a household where you didn't know your, your parent, your, one of your parents was going to walk into the house and you didn't know how that was going to go. You didn't know the state they were going to be in. So I was constantly living in a, a state of anxiety, whether I knew it or not. Like I was in, and it's really, it served me in a lot of ways as an adult, because I'm, I'm hyper aware of everything going on around me. So I'm a very empathetic person. I can like, see if somebody's feeling off. I, I, I have this sense of of really being tuned in to a lot of things, which is beautiful in a lot of ways, but it also doesn't serve me in a lot of ways too. Um, and I've, I've worked through a lot of that as, as an adult, but yeah, I grew up in a household where, um, there was a lot of violence, not towards me, but towards, towards my mother. And, um, it was, it was a very chaotic environment growing up. And I look back on, I mean, there was a lot of things where I was like, yeah, okay, this is just like how I was living. But now as an adult, I like, I feel so deeply for this like young girl who was like growing up this way. Like there were times when we would have to leave the house in the middle of the night and like, and we didn't live in a, we, I grew up in Connecticut and people who think about Connecticut think it's like a beautiful, uh, very rich place, but there's a, uh, there's, there's towns and cities in Connecticut that are, you know, pretty not rich at all and very poor. And so we grew up in in Bridgeport, which is like not a very nice place. Um, a lot of areas in Bridgeport are not nice. And we would have to walk to my grandmother's house in the middle of the night, me and my sister and my mom, in order to like get us to a safe place. So all that to say, I had a lot of trauma that I didn't work through. And growing up, high school, college, moving away, we moved to New York to go to college after high school. And, um, I think I used food and a lot of other distractions to basically push down a lot of these feelings that I was experiencing and a lot of trauma. And that showed up in my relationships that showed up in my work that showed up in like my schoolwork and in all areas of my life. And until I could really face that and say like, wow, this is like something I, I really need to work through. And I'm, I'm still continuing to work through. I think like we, it never really ends. Like we have constant things to work through. Um, yeah. Until I was like really able to be like, wow, okay. I have a lot of anxiety, I have a lot of depression. And I started to use food to cope with that, which then just leads to you know, a, uh, a very dysregulated, um, relationship with yourself and with food. And that comes with a ton of health issues as well. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's, I mean, that is very difficult to grow up like that. I mean, you just, it's funny how, you know, you almost like that's your normal, you know, and you kind of like, totally. it's, it's just like, 
that, that's almost what you expect, you know, but like I said, you, you don't actually know like that you're kind of living in constant fear, constant anxiety. And, um, yeah, I don't, I don't really know what it must be like, like, but just, just kind of devastating. And you mentioned something there about it impacting your kind of relationships, uh, when you were, uh, I guess, you know, a, a young, a young girl. Um, I just had a guy on my podcast, really interesting guy speaking about, uh, attachment issues and how often people have these issues related to, um, their, you know, like relationship issues. Uh, that are a result of our parents and how they treated us and what we kind of expected from them. And I think fatherhood so it seems to stand out as like such a big one uh, where, where people experience issues, um, m- both male and female, you know, and uh, you probably have trust issues and all that sort of stuff. Did you experience anything like in particular? Yeah, I think like I- I've, d- I've dove into the attachment attachment styles. I definitely think I had, or probably still have anxious attachment style where, you know, again, back to this like idea of like constantly just like being, you know, very aware of everybody else. Um, and like the little, the smallest change that a partner or even a friend would make, it would like just send me into a spiral of like, what is, you know, what's happening here. Um, and yeah, especially like, you know, you, and it, it's interesting because, of course, you look at the my my father was, you know, obviously very unwell, and so there's there's sure a lot of issues that stem from that. But then you also have to look at like, and my mother, and my mother's great; she's like a great parent. But you also have to look at like the parent who was also there and was supposed to be there for you during that time, you know. And my mother had a lot to deal with. She was a single mom of two daughters and you know there's also trauma there because you also the parent who is actually there with you the majority of the time if they're unable to give you the things that you need and of course like every child is different and every child needs something different right and so there was a lot of like trauma around not feeling seen not feeling heard not being understood you know, this, this, uh, idea of like not belonging is like very, very, um, uh, I guess big in my life at the moment, especially like traveling around and the last few years has like really brought that to light of like feeling like do I even belong in this world, in this family. Like people, do people even see me? Can people, like, do people really even understand me? And, um, yeah, so there's, so there's that. And then, you know, the, your my father figure was unable to be trusted right so of course like you go into the world and you think like and this is like a big generalization but like every man is not to be trusted so there's a lot of like um, need to control and need to really be very very careful and like really keep a lot of walls up to say like is this a safe place i'm not really sure and then you know the walls come down and you're like okay this is a safe place but then this person does something that doesn't make you feel safe anymore and all of a sudden you're like running away so it's like you know there is a lot there is a lot there and you know i had yes i had a traumatic childhood and there's people who had have had more traumatic childhoods and then there's people who have had a great upbringing and yet those people still have traumas you know there is it is impossible to to go through childhood i think without any trauma and as a as a parent you know as as you are like it's it's got to be also really challenging to 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 try to raise a child without any trauma and it's impossible right like your child is gonna have trauma whether you like it or not yeah exactly i mean i mean most people are kind of i guess unaware of trauma that they're carrying or how they act as well because uh, there's not really m- many people in the world who have a great self-awareness um and have uh, also dealt with their issues because people well you can't see them a lot of the time you know and uh we we do pass those things on to onto our kids and uh that's how yeah, that's how we just don't recover necessarily um things from generation to generation but i think there's a lot of like conscious people these days and it's you know, people that are looking a bit deeper and um, it, f- it feels like there's a, there's a good renaissance of um, people just um, 
acting in, in better faith and better ways and uh, wanting to uh, reverse, say, like uh, issues that have occurred in their own families and stuff. And um, yeah, who knows, like as a world population, if we ever get to this amazing place, but uh, we can all hope that's for sure. <laughs> I was wondering, do you, uh, do you speak to your dad much? Um, is he still around? So he passed away about 10 years ago, um, which was, you know, challenging. We didn't have a good relationship. Um, I, I was, I think wise in a lot of ways, even as a young kid, like I just really knew my, my father was sick and I was like, I just didn't have any expectations of him, especially as like when my parents got divorced, my parents got divorced when I was like maybe eight, I believe. Um, and I really kept my distance. My sisters who is four years older than me, she, she, you know, she had more good times with him. So she had a better relationship with him. And she, I think was really hopeful in a lot of ways that he would change where I had the, I had the perspective that this person is ill and I can't really change him and he's not going to change and I can't really expect him to be there for me. So yeah, I, I think I kind of distanced myself, but I would still see him because my sister would be like, Oh, let's go to dinner. And I'd be like, okay, fine. And so I would go, but I, I really kept my, my distance. And then, um, I moved to LA after college and I, I didn't really speak to him much, but in the last few years, he was actually living in Portugal, which is where he's, he's from. Both my parents are from Portugal and he was living there, um, with my grandmother. She lives there still. And I think he knew he was getting sick. It was, I'm sure it was like alcohol related issues. Um, it's just hard when somebody's in Portugal and they're sick and going to the hospital. And then it's like a train of this per the doctor tells like my aunt and then my aunt tells somebody else. And then that person tells my sister and it's like the language barrier. And so it's, it's, um, yeah, it's like, we don't really know what happened. It was a heart issue, but I think he knew he was sick and he would, he was in the last year before he passed away, he was like reaching out to me and I was just like, like, why, you know, like, what are you like, I, I, like, there was no apology. There was like no responsibility. It was just like, just trying to, I guess he probably felt a lot of guilt and was like trying to reach out and have some sort of relationship with me before he passed. Um, and yeah, when he passed, I think it was challenging because I think I had a lot of, I felt like I, there was a lot of things I wanted to say that I never got a chance to say. And the grief of losing a parent is one thing, but I think the grief of losing a parent that you never really had a good relationship with and the idea of ever having a good relationship with them is completely gone was really challenging for me. I think that was like the, 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 the biggest part of the grief for me. If you ever like asked your mom for stories about him and you know, while before he was maybe an alcoholic or anything like that, any good stories? Um, yeah, my mom doesn't really like love to talk about it so much. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot, of, there's a lot of trauma there still for sure. Um, but yeah, we'll talk about it sometimes. And I went to Portugal right after he, for his funeral. So right after he passed and, um, it was really interesting to hear cause you know, it's a very small, small town, small community there. And so like, there was a lot of people at the funeral and there was, you know, all of his friends and family members there just like telling me stories of like, just like all the funny things he would do. My dad was like a great guy. Like I have also memories of him being like a great, like my, my dad was a great, fun, loving, very like personable guy when he was sober, when he was, uh, when he was drinking, he was like a completely different person. Um, so I have a lot of like, I mean, not a lot, but I do have a few like really nice memories of my father, but at the funeral, at the funeral, I was, people were telling me like all these like really amazing stories, but it was also hard for me to hear because I was like, oh, you got to experience like these really nice memories with this person that I don't have too many of those memories with. And, you know, they would say like, oh, he always talked about you guys. He would like always talk about like his daughters and it's like, I mean, it was nice, but at the same time, it's a bit sad, you know, that this person couldn't like show up and, and be the person that he wanted to be. And I think that's also probably what caused a lot of the, what caused a lot of the 
issues for him. I think there was a lot he was dealing with. And I think he went to alcohol in order to manage that. It's tough because you you almost want to go, okay, cool. Let me tell you a few stories, you know, because um, yeah, I can, I can imagine it, it must've been difficult to, to hear those. Uh, so I mean, I was, I was wondering if these two things are linked, right? This being like, uh, you know, depressed and uh, growing up with your father uh, to a tweet that you wrote. Uh, I don't know if there's like a gap in between these, but you can let me know. So you wrote, you said, how I'm aging backwards. Uh, I'm 35, bloated, gut issues, restricting all kinds of foods, slow metabolism, struggling to lose weight despite doing everything right, in inverted commas, eating 1,200 calories a day, which is nothing, (laughs) and unhappy. What was the sort of trajectory of like overcoming depression and this sort of story? Are they they related, the two of them? Yeah, for sure. I think think you can't... You know, I did, I work with a lot of clients who are struggling with gut issues and trying to lose fat and stubborn fat loss. And, um, you know, it becomes a little bit of a therapy session a lot of times because I don't think you can take the emotional, spiritual aspect of food and health apart from actually being physically healthy. Because I, yeah, I think that I, even, you know, when I was getting healthier and realizing that I had these issues to work through and improving my health and my diet, there would still be um, basically like a, a, I would revert back to those habits Right. So it's like I would be like, okay, I'm aware of this. I'm going to change it. And I would change it for a short amount of time or I would try a different diet that would like kind of distract from what the real issue was. And I would get healthier. And then these habits would creep back in. You know, if like I was going through a hard time or there was certain things going on in my life, I'd revert back to these habits. And then again, I would like find myself back to where I was. And then Again, I'd be like, okay, let me like try this other thing. And then I would get healthier. And then I think until I really started to like dive into the emotional work. And also, like, I don't think that there's, I don't think that just doing the emotional work is the key because I do think that there is food is, food is addicting. Like, it is, it, it is really hard in this modern world to, like I said before, to not, overindulge in these processed foods, right? So I think there is a balance of like, yes, you work on the emotional aspect of health and of your trauma so that you don't use food to distract yourself. And like, I think everybody does it. Even if you aren't, like, even if you're healthy, like we 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 find distractions in so many ways, social media, food, um, you know, people, relationships, like there are so many ways to distract ourselves from what we actually need to deal with. Um, but I do also think changing my diet and changing, there was a lot of things that I changed in my health that also helped me deal with the emotional things. So I don't think like you can take one away from the other. Like, I think there's like a train of thought where some people are like, you need to like get emotionally healthy and that, and then you will be healthy and you will make good food choices. And yes, I think that is true. But I also think that if you're not physically well, it's really hard to dive into the emotional stuff and 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 become more i think like become more aware of the emotional traumas and the emotional things that are happening in your emotional body right so i think it's both i think you it's good to do both at the same time i agree with the the second part i think more that you mm. you getting healthy impacts your mindset and and that's the sort of like trigger you know like they obviously the, the the two are very hard to separate okay the the mind the body the health you know which one which one comes sort of first you know what i mean but i definitely think like you know if you start getting physically healthy and, and that includes like eating different foods um then you're going to notice a massive change in your mindset and i think that has a bigger impact going in that direction as opposed to you know, the first part where you're saying, you know, like sort out your mind first and then the other stuff sort of starts happening. 
I definitely think like start running, start or start walking, start getting outside and get some fresh air, change your food, look what you're eating, make a few tweaks, and then you'll start seeing your your everything starts changing. Your your mindset, your outlet, uh, your your outlook, your your clarity, um, and and then it becomes like this awesome sort of anabolic snowball of like cool. I'm just getting like better and better and better in every part of my life. For sure. And the gut is like, you know, people with gut issues, it's, it's so, it's so connected to your, the way that you're thinking, your mindset, your mood. And so if your gut is disrupted by processed foods or whatever else you have going on, whether it's like a gut infection or, um, you know, some kind of dysbiosis or parasite or what have you, like it's going to be really hard to have a positive mindset. And I feel like even you know, for me, I'm, I'm also like my physical body is very sensitive still. And so even if I eat something kind of off or I have like a few days of just like overindulging, like I will start to be like, oh, this is like terrible. Like this world is a terrible place. My life sucks. Like, uh, you know, what am I even doing? I, you know, I might as well just like just give up on everything. And then it's like a few days of just like cleaning things up. Like, oh, OK, life is beautiful, you know, yeah. like. I'm doing okay. And like, I love my life and everything is going to be okay. You know, it's, it's really, it's, it's, there is a, a, a big connection there. So I, I do absolutely agree. Like, it's going to be really hard when you're waking up in the morning after like having a, a you know, terrible dinner to like, want to like meditate or go take a walk or, or be productive. It's going to be really challenging. So I, I do agree. I do think like the, changing the physical first allows you to then be able to reach these higher levels of, of, um, I wouldn't say like enlightenment, but you know, to, to be able to really reach those that to be able to have a better mindset and to be able to, to be more in touch with the universe and to, to really move forward and believe in something and, and have hope for the future. Absolutely. There's a really interesting book uh, called The Second Brain. I don't know if you've heard of it or, or read it, uh, but it's, it's effectively about your stomach. And it, it literally, they, you know, they say that, you know, the gut and the stomach is, I mean, it, it's such an important part of your whole kind of, you know, physiology, genetic makeup, et cetera, et cetera. Yet so many people, they have no clue about it, you know, like I was wondering how do you, you, or not you, but like, how do people, you know, realize that they've actually got gut issues, you know, like it, 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 it's because it's, it's, it's hidden, you know, it's in your tummy sort of thing. Do you, do you have any advice around it or how did it, how did it come about for you that you realized, oh, I've got gut issues here? Yeah. So I think like when people, you know, there's so many people who complain about gut issues, like bloating, especially women. It's like, I'm, I'm bloated after I eat this, or I have stomach pain, or I don't have like regular bowel movements. And it's just like a regular thing. And you have to, you have to understand that like, when I hear that, I'm like, oof, because people are just blowing it off. And it's like, well, if that's happening, there's something that's, that's dysregulated there. And it's going to be causing issues, whether or not you feel it yet it will start to cause issues in other parts of your life. So the, the basic like symptoms of gut issues, bloating, constipation, not, you know, not having a bowel movement every day, um, loose stools, constipation. If I said that gas, um, burping, you know, like sometimes when I'm around people, I'm like, it's just like, it's just, it's just like a normal, it's normal for people to be like, passing gas and burping all the time. I'm like, there's something going on there. You have to take a look at that. So, you know, stomach pain. Um, so those are the common issues and what most people think when they hear about gut issues. And so sometimes people are like, well, I don't have any of those, so I don't have any gut issues. Well, it's not necessarily. There still could be some things going on there. Um, and that could result in mood issues. So depression, anxiety. Um, it could um, also show up on the skin. So acne, uh, rosacea, eczema. Um, also like, just like, cl like skin clarity. Right. And like looking alive when I see people sometimes who just like their skin looks a bit dull. That is 
is usually a case of something happening in the gut or your nutrition, right? Um, and it could also show up in hormonal issues, libido issues, um, irregular periods, PCOS, like there are, you know, there's a wide rate fertility issues. Um, so the gut is, is very important. It can show up in a lot of different ways. And, you know, there's, there's this push to like all these gut tests that you can go do. And I've used them with clients and I think they can be valuable, but a lot of the times we just need to go back to the basics. We need to go back to our nutrition, um, our exercise, because that can be sometimes stressful and be causing gut issues, our light environment, um, getting more in nature, um, just our, our meal timing. Like these are things that like I like to make sure that people have in place before they start to go try to do something else. Because a lot of people want a magic pill. They want a supplement. They want you to like give them a protocol of exactly what they need to do. And it's like, we need to, we need to start with the basics first because our body is so smart and our bodies can heal. Our bodies can heal it. Your, your body can heal itself. So if we give it what it needs, a lot of times we don't need all these other things. Sometimes it is necessary for some people, but a lot of times it's, it's the basics and the foundations. I think what's really interesting that you, you touched on there is like people actually almost want their sort of resolution or solution to be complex. You know, like when you yeah. tell them, no, no, actually it's, it's very, very simple what you need to do. You know, like you, you need to maybe start having a, a bit of bone broth in the morning or like a hot water, warm water and lemon and salt or something. That, that's all I want you to start doing. Then they go, ah, oh, no, no, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, like they really almost want a difficult solution to their issues. And it's quite fascinating. They want a diagnosis, you know, they want like, okay, I did this test and okay, now I have SIBO. So now I know why why I'm having issues. And now I know, quote unquote, how to treat it. But the basics of all treatments are, again, the foundations, right? It's like we want the protocol. We want to see like, this is the diagnosis. And then this is the protocol. And if I just follow the protocol, I will be better. Yeah. And it's, 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 you know, and that sometimes helps, like, especially with something like SIBO. Like I see people like, okay, I'm doing a SIBO protocol. I'm like, okay, but you know how often SIBO comes back? Most people don't ever get rid of SIBO because they're doing protocol after protocol and it's actually not getting to the root of the issue. It's like, you can do the protocols if that's going to make you feel better, but is it actually going to help you get better and get to the root cause? Probably not. How did you recover from your gut issues? Speaking of, I was going to so many doctors, <laughs> <laughs> spending so much money on supplements. Like I remember just having a drawer full of supplements of like every new protocol I was trying and then reading all the blog posts, being in the Facebook groups and like just being like, oh, this this supplement worked for them. I'll try that now. And so many, I would see like naturopaths, functional medicine doctors, um, functional nutritionists. Like I was like just spending so much money just seeing all these doctors in hopes for a diagnosis, you know, just tell me what's wrong with me, why I'm having all these issues. Um, and And yeah, I think until I really started to fully educate myself on the gut and how it works, was I then able to heal myself of my issues? And I think when I was going to all these doctors and getting all these protocols and supplements and running all these tests, um, I, you know, the, they would put me on protocols and I was trying that and I would feel better, but none of them were talking to me about really nutrition. Right. None of them were asking me about like, okay, what are you, what are you eating day to day? Or like, what are your, what are your, um, your nutrition habits? Like, what time are you eating? Like, are you getting out of nature? What's, you know, like, what is, what are you doing for exercise? Like, how is your stress levels? Like they, none of them were asking about that. They were just giving me supplement after supplement. And it's like, we talk about the, um, you know, conventional medical approach and it's like just giving a, a medication or issues. And, you know, we all know how terrible that is, but the functional medicine doctors and the functional nutritionists are, can be just as bad as that. It's like, we're just giving out supplements and that's not really getting to the root of the issue. Again, 
And so until I really started to get educated on the function of the digestive system, then I was really able to say like, okay, this is where um, not doing things correctly. Like this is why this SIBO keeps coming back. This is why I continue to like have candida issues. And so I was able to actually change the function of my digestive system. And I started learning too about um, circadian rhythm, light environment. And that really started to shift things. And um, a lot of, again, these habits that were based on um, trying to emotionally regulate myself, like binge eating and overeating and eating late at night, that was causing a lot of issues too. So I think it was a multifaceted approach, right? So I was changing all the nutrition, the bad nutrition habits that I was having. I changed my the way that I was exercising. I um, started to work on the root cause, like my stomach acid and liver. And I was able to actually start to support my body so that it could actually get rid of these things that were no longer serving me so that I didn't have to continue doing protocol after protocol to quote unquote kill the, this bacteria that was in my system. Well, why is this bacteria in your system? Like, why does it keep coming? Well, it's like, because my food is not being properly di digested in my stomach. I didn't have enough stomach acid because I was constantly eating on the go and not breathing properly and <laughs> just like eating too much food at one time. And so my digestive system was so overloaded, right? So supporting that and being able to get my body to an optimal place and get my gut to an optimal place where if there were some bad bugs coming in, my body could get rid of them right at the start so that it didn't cause issues, which is how our body is designed. We are designed to do that. So when we have all these um, bacteria in our, in our gut that is not supposed to be there, we have to look at like, why isn't our body doing its job? And so that was kind of where I came to a place of, of finally being able to get these issues under control. I think it's, it's a good lesson there actually for, for everybody. When it comes to your own health, you really need to do a lot of experimentation. And, you know, sometimes that does involve going to say different doctors and uh, different nutritionists and going on these different protocols. And you, you, you actually almost need to go through that um, and do your own experimentation to kind of learn, okay, cool, this is what works for me. This is what doesn't. This is what's true. This is what's not true. And, um, you know, like if you can treat your health that way, like ultimately you're going to get to this awesome place of sort of like um, operating. And, uh, you know, I know my life, I've constantly experimented with, with training with uh, different types of diets, et cetera, et cetera. And now like, now I, I understand my body, right? And I'm totally dialed in to what works and what doesn't. I know when I'm like putting on a bit of weight, like, okay, cool. This is what you need to do, Gareth, you know, sort of cut this out. And, um, but you have to go through that, I think, to actually uh, learn what is good for you. It's very easy to get caught up in this world of like uh, health and fitness and nutrition and stuff. And like, um, you know, like you go, Oh, it's just so complex, but actually it's not complex. You are your own scientist. So give it a go and give yourself a few years to kind of test things out. So I think it's, it's a really important thing that everyone needs to actually do. Yeah. We also expect like what works for us now is going to work for us forever. And that is not always true as well. Right. Because we change your environment, things in your life change. Um, your, you know, your, your body is different, your needs are different, your goals are different. So constantly evolving and changing is really important. And you're right. Like that is how you learn it's making mistakes. You know, we can like beat ourselves up like, oh, why didn't I know this sooner? It's like, well, you couldn't like, you only know what you know in the moment. Right. And that's like part of life is like, you have to make those mistakes. And I also think for me, like I look back on all of that time and I'm like, oh, I'm so grateful for that. It's not only like, okay, I've learned so much. I've learned what doesn't work. And I, I also see this in my clients, right? Where they're like, they're, they're seeking that. And I can also feel very empathetic to that, right? Where I'm like, I know what that feels like, which is like why I do what I do. Because like, I also wasted so much time. And I mean, it's not wasted now because it, again, it's a learning experience, but you know, I want to save fuel from, from at least taking as long as it did for me. Like, okay, you can make your mistakes and then like, hopefully 
I, you know, my goal is to help you get to a better place without, without having to spend so many years and so much money and time and energy finding a solution. Right. I think it's cool that, I think it's very cool that people like yourself are sort of now rising to the top, you know, and, and I guess where people might've gone to say like a doctor or, or somebody else, like now they're like, Oh no, cool. There's this Amanda or, you know, whoever else it is like, let's go speak to her first. And that sort of speeds up the process, like you're saying, of them getting healthier quicker because they're actually getting better advice, more honest advice. And you don't really have like these almost ulterior motives or ulterior incentives whereby, you know, if you prescribe this medicine, you get tons of cash sort of thing. Like yours is a different model completely. And I think, I think that's sort of um, a, a great thing for people, you know, that we now have these options uh, available to all of us. I was just going to say too, like sometimes like sometimes you have to really be ready for that. And so sometimes people aren't really ready to like get healthy. And so they, you know, you will come to the right place, the right time and the right person who can help you when you're ready. I do believe that. Yes. Yeah. I totally believe that as well. You touched on supplementation. What are your thoughts on supplements? I take a ton of supplements still, but, um, and it's funny when people see like my stash of supplements, they're like, wow, it's really interesting. But I would say that they are, I mean, I was in, I was at my family's house in Connecticut um, last week and I was like living out of a suitcase. All my supplements were like in a bag somewhere. And I was like, I just don't feel like pulling them out. And I was fine. Like, I don't need them. However, I do think like if all the foundations are in place, supplements can be great to just bring you to the next level or optimize things. And I think a lot of people just take supplements like willy nilly, like, oh, this person is taking this, so I'll take that too. Or like, oh, somebody said this is like good for X, Y, Z, so I'll take that. And I I do blood tests every like three to six months to actually look at like what's going on. And also I'm like educated. So it's like I can look at my blood test and be like, okay, like this is what I need. And I'm going to take a little bit more of this or like, oh, I don't need this anymore. I'm going to stop taking this. Or also like looking at my lifestyle and my environment and like what's going on in my life. Like what, what do I need in this moment to help me and to help optimize? And, you know, people like us were like, like, I don't want to just settle for like, oh, okay, I'm fine. I'm okay. Like, I'm like, okay, I'm going to take the supplements so that I can be like a little bit better, right? Like improve my gains in the gym or like help my sleep a little bit more or um, supplement my diet that maybe is like not a hundred percent optimal in this moment in time. So I do think that they are great supplements to an already good lifestyle, nutrition, exercise, lifestyle. Do you like worry at all about, I guess, because the supplement industry is like not regulated, okay? And they, that means there's a lot of dodgy stuff. Like the other day, my wife was telling me here in Brazil that a lot of the creatine was sort of, um, had, I don't know what it was, but had some sort of toxins in it, right? So for quite a few of the companies. And, you know, people wouldn't even really know that. And I think, you know, my understanding a lot of the time about, like say, proteins and things like that is, a lot of them come from really the same place. Like, you know, one place sort of produces a whole lot of it and um, everyone just buys from it and then puts their own sort of branding and stuff on it. Um, yeah, is that like, do you have any concerns, concerns at all? Like, how do you actually source yours if you if you go about it? Yeah, there there is, it's, it's a definitely a big issue like with heavy metals and supplements and protein powders and all kinds of things. Um you know, I think the consumer is getting really smart. And so I think we are aware of this and the companies are now starting to um, give out their heavy metal testing. So a lot of these companies are actually doing tests. So I think if you just buy from a reputable company that has this testing done on these products, I think that's probably the best way to go. Um, you can email like companies that you like and ask for their um heavy metal testing and see if they'll give it to you. A lot of these companies like just say that like, oh no, that's fine. But actually they're not giving you the report. So it's like, I want to see it. So you can always ask. Um, sometimes they have it readily available. Sometimes you just have to like email and ask for it. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a big issue. Even like water, you know, like there's, um, I forget there's, 
there's somebody on, I forget what his Instagram is, but he's, he does all these, um, he does testing on all these water companies like Topo Chico and Pellegrino and um, Mountain Valley. And he does like all these testing on them to actually see what's, what's in it. And it's, it's pretty fascinating. So we have to be concerned with all of it, you know, not just supplements, but water and food. It's like the soil, there can be a lot of heavy metals in the soil and then we're ingesting that. So it's tough because as consumers, we have to be so diligent and we have to like do our own research, you know, but, um, yeah, I think I try to do my best with that. And then at the same time, I try not to be so concerned, you know, I try to do what I can and then not stress out about the rest of it. Yeah. And I think that's important. Like literally do do the best you can, you know, because in this day and age, it's, it's very hard to avoid everything. You just can't, you know, I mean, unless you live on a, your own piece of land and you have only your own veggies and you have a stream running through it and you have your own cows and salmon in the river, like you, then you're cool, you know, but, uh, if you're everybody else, which is probably 99.9% of us, then there's some sort of like toxins that are going to be in your daily sort of, um, environment. And, uh, you just need to do as much as you can to kind of mitigate that. I had a really interesting, and then also just yeah. making sure that you're that you're making sure that you're as healthy as you can be in, in every other aspect so that your body can detox those effectively as well. Absolutely. We are going to absorb these toxins. We are going to ingest these toxins. It's like, of course it's going to happen. So we have to just do our best to make sure we're as healthy as we can be. You said something interesting earlier on about like eating at night and overeating at night. I think it's not an uncommon thing for people to do. I actually find myself like, I always kind of want a little bit of a snack, you know, like I have this, uh, sweet tooth you know where i'm like mm, let me get something sweet i ha have a very nice concoction which i've made which is a, a frozen banana av and avocado and passion fruit smoothie that i'll it'll be my go-to so so that's what i can kind of go to but it's not always available right so i haven't always prepared it sort of thing so sometimes a piece of chocolate and whatever else sneaks in there but um you know i think it's not uncommon for people to Overeat it doesn't have to be something sweet, but uh, you know a lot of the time it is. Um, what 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 is that related to? I think a lot of times it's like we're tired and we are like. I mean, for me personally, when I do it, it's like I'm tired, and then I'm like, I just want to like do like like X Y Z before I go to bed, you know. And then I'm just like, it's almost like giving yourself a reward before you go do the thing. For me, and I think a lot of other people, that seems to be the issue. Sometimes like we're just tired. And we're like looking for food to give us energy and we just need to go to sleep and like do whatever we need to do in the morning if possible. Um, so sometimes that happens. Um, I think sometimes it can be because we haven't eaten enough during the day. So um, especially with women, you know, who are trying to lose weight, they're just like trying to restrict all day, not eat too much. And then at the end of the day, your willpower is just so low because you've, you've been using that muscle and that muscle is tired that you are just like, screw it. And you just, you know, eat whatever is available to you. Um, a lot of times too, like, um, blue light can also stimulate hunger and it can increase your blood sugar. So a lot of times if we're in an environment with all the lights on in front of our screen, we can actually be causing ourselves to have these cravings and hunger. So that is one thing I, I try to get everybody to do is like to just turn off all the overhead lights, use some like candlelight or a red light or Himalayan salt lamp or something so that you're not spiking that blood sugar and you're not increasing your hunger and cravings. Um, cause it can be like, it, you know, it's, I think if, if I think it's one of the most important things, like if that's all everybody changed, it would probably dramatically change their health because it's going to affect your sleep eating late at night is going, going to majorly affect your sleep and not having a good night of sleep is going to then crave, cause you to have more of these carbohydrate and sugar cravings and hunger throughout the day. And so you'll start to find a lot of people when I try to push their eating window up a little bit that they're like, oh, I'm actually like my hunger is less in, in the daytime when I don't do that. And you would think it would be opposite. You'd think like, oh, if I haven't eaten for a few hours before I go to sleep and then I'm sleeping all night, not eating, I'd wake up more hungry. 
but it actually tends to be the opposite again because of blood sugar and um and just like your circadian rhythm so if you can get a really good night of sleep where your hormones are being regulated you're doing a lot of healing at night rather than digesting this meal that you've eaten before you've gone to sleep you're going to be a much healthier version of yourself waking up that next day without having had a big meal or even a, even a small meal before you've gone to sleep i think it's underestimated like the the power of sleep um you know you obviously are well aware of it uh, i think it's matthew walker he he wrote a fascinating book on it uh, why we sleep and actually that i l- i remember first listening to him on joe rogan and uh and I, that actually changed how I slept. Like I listened to it, then I bought his book and I read his book. And I, because there was one line in there where he he talks, he didn't really speak about like um, eating as much as, as that I can remember right now, you know, but the thing that stood out for me in that particular podcast, he was like, most people think that they can operate on, you know, like not most people, but lots of people think they can operate on like five, six hours. And then he said, that's total rubbish. He's like, like 95 or 98, 99, whatever it is, percent of people actually need seven to eight hours to uh, be sort of optimal. And I was like going to bed at 11, waking up at 4.30 sort of thing. Um, that was my routine at the time. And, uh, but I listened to that podcast and I was like, yeah, hey, I've got to change. And uh, literally, you know, almost overnight, I, I sort of started changing my routine. And um, in, now these days, I don't even use an alarm anymore. So it's like, very different to to back then, but but sleep is you know sleep is huge. He he starts his book. I don't know if you've read it, but he started with like these three or four pages that are just like so hard hitting that you're like, whoa, I've got to uh, really sort of take you know take more notice of of my sleep. Um, and yeah, really fascinating. What did you change? Did you just start going to sleep earlier, or, did, or was there a lot of other things you changed? It was yeah, it was mainly going to sleep earlier. Um, also just not having like distractions in the evening, you know, like being on my phone, uh, yeah, which is, I mean, it, it's very difficult, I guess, you know, you would know like running your own business and these sort of things, like you all, I don't know, there's this pull towards your phone, you know, and there's, there's only sort of, yeah. I mean, I've also got a, a daughter now. So like the times that I can do things, you know, like, especially these days, I actually have to do stuff in the evening sort of thing. So, you know, uh, when I, when I was, when I didn't have a daughter, I could change my, my routine back then. No problem. Uh, but, uh, yeah, those were probably the best and uh, the, the, the sort of two main ones. Um, but then also just being like very consistent with, um, like weekends and stuff too, because he says your, the consistency of your, your sleep is important. So, you know, some, and you can never catch up sleep. Like that was a really interesting one for me, you know, and I mean, it's now that you think about it, it's so logical, but he was like, yeah, lots of people like they work during the week, you know, and they, they really like, you know, they, they burn the candle on both ends and then they go, I'm going to make, make up for it on the weekend. And he's like, you never make up for it on the weekend. Um, you almost have to have a seven day consistent going to bed, uh, and waking up sort of routine. So, yeah, I guess those are the sort of three changes at, at the time. And yeah, now it's uh, now it's uh, much more advanced than that. I would say. <laughs> I think also waking up with an alarm clock is it's. I think one of the best things we could do, and I know not everybody can do that, but I think it's um, it's just a, such a better way to wake up. It's yeah, like it's, you're just like um like immediately just, just like raising your cortisol and like your day is just starting off like just so alarming. Yeah, exactly. It's like you get this fright from your alarm. You're like, oh, geez, and you start your day in this sort of like. Uh, anxious sort of stressed out state, you know, so it's a, uh, it's a tough one. It's a tough one for almost everyone these days because society is structured not for our nourishment. It's, it's structured for making cash and like, you know, being at work like super early and like whatever it is, you know, and schools are definitely not structured the right way either. Like when you read this book, to me, it was so fascinating because at the time I was like looking after a team when I was working in the investment bank. And it made me understand my staff so much better, you know, as well, because you, you, you realize, you know, some people are morning people and some people are not morning people. And, and it's actually, it's not like because they're moody that they're, that, that, that's not why. It's actually in their DNA that they are not a morning person. They're, they literally are an evening person. So 
if we understood this better as like people who are leaders and look after people, we'd be like much more sort of sympathetic to, you know, this person coming in the office in the morning and, or we might even go, you know what, you must come in at 10 rather, you know, and they'll be like, oh, that's amazing. Thank you. Uh, so, so much of society has been structured the wrong way. Um, and uh, I think more people knew about like, you know, sleeping patterns and everything around that we could, we could operate like way more efficiently and optimally. Yeah. Cause you could be getting by on like, you know, a few hours less of sleep, but is that actually serving you? And is that optimal? And like, what could you be doing with like, actually, you know, like you could actually be getting so much more done on less sleep. And I think that's why people, I mean, on more sleep, I think that's why people are like, I just want to, you know, do more. So I want to sleep less, but actually if you sleeping well, you're actually going to be more productive during the day and working less. It's sort of counterintuitive to understand that, you know, people don't necessarily get that, you know, they're like, mm, no, that doesn't make sense. I need the more hours in the day. And you're like, no, no, you need to just work smarter and with higher energy levels, really, so you can, you can focus better. Uh, the, the other interesting part actually was around like, you know, like we have different phases of our lives where we, where we sleep um, say more. And, and one of them was for teenagers, you know, like we always like, go, Oh, the teenagers, they're so lazy. Like they, they just want to sleep in and wake up late. And, and no, that's actually not, not what it is at all. They're not lazy. It's just their bodies, right? It's the phase of their life where their hormones are going absolutely crazy and their bodies are going through such massive growth spurts that they require that extra sleep you know, and, um, you know, like, so, so when you're forcing them to go to school at like 7 a.m., it is a total waste of time. So if we actually said, you know what, cool, teenagers, you guys, school only starts at 11, you know, it's going to finish much later, but that's cool. They'll be like, oh, it doesn't matter. But they'll be so much more sort of, you know, productive in their time and sort of taking in information and maybe even wanting to be at school than, you know, sort of walking around moping their heads for the first four hours because <laughs> they're not, they're half asleep still. So it's very interesting. Like sleep is fascinating. Yeah. And schools, uh, the school system is just not set up to, to help us at all. And I don't know how it is in other countries, but I mean, like homeschooling is probably the way to go. I think. Totally agree. I mean, I'm definitely homeschooling my daughter. Like as much as I, like I loved school. Okay. And I had a great time at it, but like, I, it feels like the world has shifted, you know, quite dramatically since I left school. And, you know, I mean, you just need half a brain cell to, to see what's kind of going on. <laughs> you know what I mean? And they, they're not necessarily teaching our kids things that they should be taught. And, um, you know, they, they, I guess some of schools are a waste of time. It's, it feels like the subjects that you get taught, the amount of time you spend there, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm a massive, uh, massive fan of uh, definitely homeschooling. I think uh, I've spoken to quite a few parents that actually do homeschool their kids. I've actually had a couple of homeschooled kids on the podcast. They were so bright, so sharp. Um, I've met like homeschooling families traveling and their kids were just like next level you know, had zero issues with like socializing, like that most people worry about and stuff. They were way advanced in terms of socializing and um, got plenty of interaction with people and other kids and stuff still. So it, uh, there's a nice renaissance going on there too, I think, which is, which is promising. Yeah. I saw that there's like a company now that's like doing this for people and like setting this up where you basically like go with your family and uh, you, you kind of like live in a, in uh, a community with other families that are doing the same thing and so you're like traveling so you like spend like six months or a year in some place and then you like go somewhere else i was like wow how fascinating for sure and, what, and then what, you get to travel and like kids get to see the world it's amazing yeah i mean traveling for me is like the, one of the greatest teachers in uh in life you know like unless you have you know once you've traveled you realize okay cool now this is me finding out who i am what the world's about, what other cultures are like, uh, just meeting other people, getting cool ideas, um, realizing that there's so many other cool options out there when it comes to, say, work that you can do and how you can do it. And it's just the greatest thing ever, I think, like in terms of, um, yeah, just self-realization, learning, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that's also a nice segue because I wanted to ask you, you you've, been on a journey, I think, since like 2020. You wrote, 
I left Los Angeles where I was living for the last 15 years in October 2020. I packed up all my belongings and then shipped them to Colorado at the time. I thought I would move there. Luckily, you made it away eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Four years later. <laughs> exactly. And then you said, but then I thought, why not travel for a little, little before finding a permanent place um, in Colorado? And you did. And you've been basically all around the world. So how was it? You know, like, how do you find yourself now when you look back at that, uh, that sort of young girl that's, that left, uh, you know, five years ago, four years ago? Yeah, I had no idea what, <laughs> how things are going to shift and change for me. And I've, I mean, I feel like I'm a completely different person from that person who left LA. Um, yeah, I didn't think I would still not have a home <laughs> at this point. That's for sure. And my stuff is still in a pod somewhere in Colorado, like waiting for me to figure out what I want to do with all of my things. And it's funny, it's like all the things that you think you need, like I haven't needed any of them for the last four years. So it, it'll be interesting to see what I thought was worth keeping um, when I finally go through those things. But yeah, so I didn't I didn't think that I'd be traveling so long, but I didn't know I was ready to leave LA. And then, um, yeah, I just figured like, I might as well just like travel a little bit. And I just like thought it would be for a few months. And then you start to travel and you're right. It's like, like what an experience, like see the world. And then you're like, oh, and then you talk to people and they tell you about a place, you know, and you're like, oh, I want to go there. And it's, it's hard now to stop traveling because I'm like, you know, I'm like, oh, do I, is this where, do I want to like get a lease and just like be here or do I want to like keep kind of moving around? And of course that's, that's challenging too. But yeah, I think like your, everything expands in traveling. Your ability to handle the unknown expands. Um, for me, my ability to like, create friendships has like really expanded. I feel like I'm so good at that now. I'm like, I get to a new place and I'm like, okay, I'm going to like make some best friends like right away. And it has become like really easy for me. And it's your, your view of yourself, your ability to the, the knowing of yourself, I think expands so much. Like I've gotten to know so much of myself. I, I, yeah, it hasn't been easy. Like I went through a pretty dark period during that time and it's hard. It's lonely. It can be really lonely sometimes. Um, and then when you don't have a home, you're just like, where do I go? When you're having a hard time, you're like, where do I go? Like, cause you're just, I remember one time I was like having such a moment and I was like crying and I was like, I just want to go home. <laughs> and I'm like, there's nowhere to like, where's, where is that? Like, like, LA wasn't home anymore. Colorado wasn't home for sure. Like I could go back to my family's house, but like, that's not home anymore either. So it really teaches you, at least it taught me like to find this home in myself. And it sounds so cheesy, but it's like, so true. It's like you, at the end of the day, you only have yourself to rely on. You only have yourself to make you happy. And regardless of where you are, you only have yourself to make that place your home and to feel comfortable and to feel settled and to feel, um, yeah, to like feel okay. And that was very challenging. And now, you know, now, um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out where that home is, but at the end of the day, like, I know that I will be okay because all I have, I have, my, I have myself to rely on. I love, um, I love the lessons. And the, the one thing is like, when you go traveling, especially by yourself, is you actually really put yourself out there and you, 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 you're forced to make friends, right? Like you, you don't really have a choice. You know what I mean? You, you do have a choice. Your choice is to kind of just stay and be that isolated person who goes into their sort of dorm or maybe you've got your own room or whatever the story is. And then you stay there by yourself and you don't make any friends and you don't have great experiences, et cetera. But traveling by yourself really sort of pushes you and you go, okay, cool. Here we go. I've got to sort of like puff up my chest and I've got to just um, go and say hello to this person, you know, and it's, it really does help with, I guess, building your, your confidence and your social skills and, and everything. Like it's, it's, it's a great thing to do. I was wondering how, how did you find 
traveling as a single girl? Like, did you find it, did you ever feel unsafe at all? Did you, you know, find guys to travel with? How did you sort of navigate that? Well, half the time I was traveling with uh, a partner at the time. Um, that was like the first half of my travel, I would say. Um, and then, yeah. And then that was challenging to then go travel on my own after tra having traveled with somebody. And then also just like dealing with the feelings of, of, of a breakup while you're traveling alone in the world in foreign countries. Um, so yeah, that was challenging, but I, I mean, I think I chose places to go fairly wisely. Like I didn't kind of choose any like obscure places where I would feel unsafe, but it's interesting. Like I felt safer in a lot of places in Central America than I do in the States. Like I was in Dallas, like a few weeks ago and I was like, wow, I feel a bit unsafe here. Like, I feel like I was like more on edge than I would be in like Costa Rica or Mexico. Um, so that's just, you know, interesting. Cause I think a lot of people have this idea of like traveling to a country in Central America or, and feeling unsafe. And I felt quite the opposite. Um, there were a few, I would say like the, it's, it's very few and far between where I felt unsafe. There was, I would say like, I went to Panama city alone. And I think that was like the one place where I was like, I don't feel comfortable walking outside in, in the dark on my own, even during the day was like a bit shady. Um, but that was like the only place where I felt a little uneasy. Um, and of course, like you have to be smart in general, like just like you would be in the States or anywhere else, like where, where you live, um, you know, you always have to kind of be like watching your back and making just like keeping an eye on things and just like, don't do anything stupid. And like, I also like, don't, I, I drink a little bit like from time to time, but I'm, I wasn't like going out and getting drunk and like walking home by myself drunk. Like I think you really need to be careful about those kinds of things. Um, but yeah, you always just like have to keep an eye on your, your stuff. And I think like building community is really important, especially when you're traveling alone, like making friends with your neighbors, which I feel like is just easier to do in a foreign country than in America, it seems. But just like, I felt like, especially in Costa Rica, like I felt very safe because I had like a great community there and it's a small town and people know you. So we're always looking out for you. Um, like just, yeah, people were just constantly looking out for you. Like I would, like a few times I would be wearing a cap and I was driving an ATV and a few times like my cap, you're driving fast and like cap flies off. And like every time it was like, there was like somebody who was like running to get it for me and like handing it to me, you know, and that's just like a simple thing, but people were very much, it's like very community minded and people were always looking out for you. So I felt, felt fairly safe in a lot of in a lot of places. Um, yeah, but I think you just have to be, you just have to be smart and just always like keep an eye on things. Yeah. You definitely have to have like this sort of sixth sense of what's going on. Uh, cause yeah, otherwise you can get yourself into a bit of trouble. You know, you go down wrong road or, you know, make a silly mistake here and there. And yeah. And it just, it also teaches you to trust your intuition. You know, and I think like that, that's a big one where it's like, if you, if things feel a bit weird or things feel unsafe, like you need to leap, like you should follow that. If you have like, even if you have no evidence of it being unsafe, if you have a feeling about something, like you should, you should follow that. Or if you're getting in a, a taxi or an Uber or whatever with like something just feels off, like just leave. Or if you're somewhere, if you're with, like, it's just, it, you really need to follow your intuition. I think like that's, that's the biggest one of all. And especially as women, I think we have fairly good intuition and we just have to learn to trust that instead of gaslighting ourselves and being like, oh, it's fine. You know, just stay or just don't worry about it. Or you're being crazy. Like just follow your intuition. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. And on that trip, you also launched your current business. Is that right? I was, al I was already, um, I was already in business. I was already doing uh, nutrition consulting and coaching. Um, I was also doing some personal training in LA before I left. So I kind of closed that door and continued to grow my more virtual nutrition business. But I did launch a course. So I had launched, I have a course called Fat Loss 101 that I launched right before I left, a few months before I left. And then I launched uh, my other course, Gut Health 101, on the road while I was traveling. And then I also created and um, launched 
a recipe book, a dessert recipe book called Protein Bakes that I have. And I did that on the road, which was challenging because it's hard to find, you know, certain flowers or products or what have you, especially like organic and high quality stuff sometimes. Um, but yeah, I was able to create that. I did do the photos myself. Um, I created the recipes and then sent them to a photographer and she was able to like recreate the recipe and then take photos of it. But yeah, I was able to kind of do all of that on the road, which was amazing. That's the cool thing about now, you know, like it is anything is possible, you know, if you sort of put your mind to it and uh, we have the technology available to us and that's the good side of technology, that's for sure. Uh, so yeah, and, and you're the type of people that, or the type of person that people would meet traveling and going, go, wow, check, check Amanda what she's doing. She's like, you know, running her business and she's traveling and like, you know, you, you don't even realize, but like just through maybe conversations and stuff, you almost inspire other people to go, okay, cool. Well, wow, it's a possibility, you know, let me, let me have a look into it. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. I was, uh, I was just wondering what are you, what are you sort of most excited about uh, and you have coming up in the future? Um, I don't want to say too much, but I have, um, I have a food product I'm coming out with. Um, uh, I'm starting to kind of dive into the research and trying to figure out how that will go. So that will be a new experience for me and something I've never done before, but um, I'm fairly excited about that. That sounds really cool. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you 10 more questions about that, but, but I won't. <laughs> um, and then if people want to get hold of you, what's the best way for them to get in touch or follow you? Yeah. So I, sp I spend a lot of time on Instagram. Um, so I'm at raw fitness and nutrition there. And then on Twitter, I think it's raw fit nutrition on Twitter, spending some more time on there. And you can also check out my website. It's raw fitness and nutrition.com. And everything is there. I have my courses there. I also have like a bunch of free guides and free re resources there, a bunch of blog articles as well. And yeah, it's pretty much the, pretty much it for where I'm spending some time online. And that's cool. Yeah. Your website is great. And I really encourage people to go, go check it out and I love your posts on, on Twitter. It's uh, very raw, true, and honest. Uh, I actually have personally tried to move away from Instagram. I'm trying to really just zone in on like maybe just one platform, maybe two, you know, and not be distracted. Like just, I don't know, there's just so so much going on in the world. You know, it's easy to, you know, like open Instagram and then you, you've been there for like three hours and you're like, what am I doing? Like, I'm, you know what I mean? So I'm like, I'm really trying to sort of do that. And e even though it's, you know, I guess, and if you use it properly, it's, it's, it's good for business. Um, but yeah, the, you sometimes just got to weigh up what is good and, and what is serving you and what's not. Now, that's my experience at least at the moment. Yeah, for sure. It's, it can be like a, a, a an unneeded distraction from everything else you have going on, but it's all, yeah, I think it's also great. I mean, I've met, I've met so many people just like being in a new city or a new, you know, a new country. And they're like, oh, I live here too. And I've met up with people. It's like, it's a, it's a beautiful place, but you have to use, you have to learn to use it wisely. But I'm the same. I've been mostly on Instagram for the last few years and now um, spending more time on Twitter and even threads. Threads seems to be like a nice place where it's, it's, you're able to reach a lot more people. So that's where I've been kind of tr focusing on growing a little bit more because yeah, it's, um, Instagram is it's a challenge these days. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, my last question for you is, uh, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Oh, good question. Um, I think it means, I mean, when I hear that, I feel like it's just like, just be your silly self. Like, just don't worry. I think like we're so, we're so fearful of like what other people think of our, of us and like, I've been also just trying to be out in the world and just like, this is who I am. And like, you can take it, you can leave it, you can love it, you can hate it, like whatever you want to do with that. Like, I only can control the way that like, I want to feel as happy as I can be. And the way that I can do that is like to show up and with all of my crazy things that I do, especially like with health and, you know, my red light devices and the way that I eat and like the way that I live my life, like just fully accept yourself and you will also attract the people who accept you as well. I think that's the most important thing is like, you know, your authenticity will sort of bring those people in that, that want to sort of be part of 
your story and your gang and your tribe and what you're doing. And, um, you know, that I think more people are craving that as well these days. They're definitely craving that authenticity and that like relatability too, because there's so much rubbish out there and so many people just not, uh, sort of portraying who they actually are. And, and I think, uh, but, but people are not stupid, you know, then they're, they're eventually like, mm, we can see what you're doing here. And, um, that's why people like yourself will, will end up sort of rising to the top and are rising to the top and, and do really, really well. So I just wanted to say like a massive thank you for, for coming on the podcast. It's been very cool chatting to you. You've got a great energy about you. Uh, I can imagine that, um, yeah, people are gravitate towards you because of the, the way that you are, you know, like, uh, you know, your smile and just like being, you know, happy and, and friendly and open about your stories. I think that is really cool and um, it will encourage other people to do the same more. Uh, so yeah, I lo- we, there's so much we, we didn't cover, right? <laughs> and it's always like that. Uh, so, you know, I just wanted to say thanks for, for all your time and for everything that you shared. Thank you. I really appreciate that. This was really fun. I really, I really enjoyed this, this time together. Mm, cool. <laughs>